So I believe that every person on the planet has the potential to be and deserves to be an educated and empowered innovator. I'm going to talk about what that means. Uh, it's not something that's going to happen naturally. I think we need to nudge it to happen. I think it's important that it happens. And I'm going to sketch a roadmap that I think can efficiently take us there. So I myself wanted to be somebody who could create things. So I went to engineering school. I was jealous of what I thought future generations would get in terms of flying cars and jetpacks, and I wanted those, and I wanted to help make them. Um, so I went to engineering school, studied all the things, came out with way too many degrees, and was surprised when my sister Layla, who's an artist and a sculptor, proved to be a much better welder and blacksmith and machinist and maker than I was. So instantly embarrassed and instantly envious. If I had an idea, maybe I could write a computer program about it. If she had an idea, she just made the damn thing. So <laughs> she really inspired me to actually make things with my hands. Um, but I didn't have the time, money, or inclination to go back to college to learn 3D printing or things like that. 3D printing had just come on the scene. But thankfully, so had YouTube. And I consider YouTube the world's university. You can learn pretty much anything watching a YouTube video. Uh, and there are even free design software tools now, where if you have a laptop, you can download one of these free tools, and if you have an idea in your head, an image, you can sketch it in 2D or 3D, uh, realize it digitally. And now there are amazing machines like 3D printers and laser cutters that can take that digital file and create the thing for you. So again, if I have an idea in my head, an art project, a retail product, an invention, it's really easy now to sketch that out digitally, and I can learn how to do that by watching YouTube for free. And there are machines that will make that for me. And if I need money for materials or access to tools, I can run a crowdfunding campaign where if I have a good idea, I can pitch it to the world. And if the world agrees that it's a good idea, they'll actually reward it. And I've seen this happen uh, a whole lot. Not always, but, but very, very often. So I became really fascinated with the maker culture, uh, so much so that I, I created a clubhouse for makers called the Idea Foundry in Columbus. That's our building. And uh, we have tools, we teach classes, we sell memberships, and we build community. It's a community of artists and engineers and entrepreneurs and innovators. Been around for 11 years. We have about 700 members, half of whom are small businesses or entrepreneurs or startups. Uh, really amazing, really fun place. And one of the most amazing things I've seen come out of it was built by my friend Todd Perkins. So Todd didn't go to college for design or engineering, but always wanted to design and build his own electric motorcycle. So he taught himself everything he needed to know about 3D design, 3D machining, all the electrics, built his bike at our shop, and it spent a month on display at the Motorcycle Hall of Fame. So here you have somebody with vision and passion and grit who learned what they needed to know, to know for free on the web, uh, built this amazing machine, and, uh, and was really um, gratified to do so. I've been gratified to see this happen, too, and I think there are millions more people like Todd around the planet who have an incredible idea and don't know that the last 10 years have made it very much easier to actually realize that physically. So I took a, a step back, and I asked myself, you know, what is the, the real value of this culture now? And it occurred to me, you know, it might be obvious in retrospect, but life is hard. Uh, in my opinion, technology makes life easier and more fun. That's Alex's definition of the purpose of technology, to make life easier and more fun. And I think technology improves one innovation at a time. So then I asked myself, where are our innovators? Who are the people improving technology? And you might think that it's scientists and engineers, uh, I think these folks are good problem solvers, but not necessarily good problem identifiers. And to be a real innovator, I think you have to be like an entrepreneur. You have to find a problem first, and then go about solving it. So I asked myself, uh, who finds problems? Um, and I thought, well, folks who work. What about farmers? What about nurses? What about factory workers? What about moms? Uh, you know, my, uh, my mom actually invented a device to help me patent it when I was a kid as a housewife. So thanks, mom. Love you. Um, but I think these people get up every day and do work, whether or not they're paid to do it. And I'd love everyone to think that if you find a problem during your day, don't just think that's life as usual. Don't just grin and bear it, stub your toe on it. You're empowered to think of a solution, design it, even build it, and share it. And if it's something that plagues you, 
it's probably something that other people have a problem with as well. So if you're sharing your innovation, you're making life easier and more fun for other people. So I think this is critically important because I think this is about to happen. Uh, automation, AI, and robotics are no doubt going to bring a whole lot of value to the planet. Uh, they're going to change the world. We're all going to be better for it. But it's going to be a bumpy and disruptive 10, 20, 30 years for the next couple of decades. Uh, because, of course, they'll be doing work that humans are doing now. Uh, and if you don't think this is a, a critical issue today, this is a self-driving shuttle in Columbus today. Uh, it's free. It drives a circuit around downtown. It's awesome. It's fun. I've been on it. But this does mean that shortly, uh, people who drive cars and trucks are going to have to find new jobs. Uh, that is the number one employer around the planet, driving a car or a truck. In the U.S., in the Midwest, driving a truck is the number one employer. So these folks will all have to get new jobs granted. Um, but what about other industries? Since these cars don't text and drive, don't drink and drive, they follow the rules, uh, they, they get in far fewer accidents, which means the autobotic collision industry is impacted. Uh, maybe the automotive insurance industry is impacted. Now you're talking about white-collar jobs in offices. And if there's always a fleet of efficient electric self-driving cars just an app tap away, then why am I paying for my car to sit in the driveway 22, 23 hours a day and its insurance? Um, so if we're buying fewer cars, maybe Detroit is getting disrupted. So this is a, this is a critical issue. Uh, and, uh, and I think that places like the Idea Foundry in Columbus can empower the grassroots innovators there, or a place like CoMade here can empower the innovators of Cincinnati. Uh, but what about people all around the world? What about folks in India or Africa? Uh, a clever social entrepreneur in India realized that you need to make uh, a browsable tablet, a laptop, that the local populace can afford. So he invented what's called the Akash 2. This is a phablet. It's a terrible word, but a great product. It's a <laughs> phone and a tablet. It can make calls. It can browse the web. It can download and run simple software. And it's affordable for the local folks. Uh, but of course, in many parts of the world, you still need electricity. This is one of my favorite crowdfunded projects. It's called the Gravity Light. Uh, it's an LED that hangs from a hook on a ceiling, and it comes with a canvas back, uh, bag that you fill with rocks or sand, lift it up. As gravity pulls it down, it spins a generator and creates clean light and electricity. So I think a handful of these can power that tablet that I showed in the previous slide. But of course, you still need internet to get access to all the education, the software, the communication with other innovators. Uh, Google has this ridiculous program to beam Wi-Fi to the planet with a fleet of hot air balloons. Uh, it's called Project Loon. It's a great TED Talk. Check it out. Uh, they intentionally named it Loon because they know it sounds loony. But uh, it's already been demonstrated to work in New Zealand. And in fact, it provided cell service for people in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. So let's take this together. Conceivably, you can be standing in a field in India or in Africa, or you can be in a coal town in Appalachia. And you can have a device that the local folks can afford. You can power it for free. You have access to uh, Wi-Fi. You can learn nearly anything, design nearly anything. And if you want to build something, you don't actually need access to a 3D printer right in front of you. There are services now where you can email your file to a company, and they will mail you back a 3D printed part. Check out shapeways.com, uh, or a machined metal part, or a printed circuit board if you want an electronic device. So it's easier than ever now to take an idea out of your head and hold it in your hand. And I think this is especially important because this is Alex's model of how any, an idea comes out of somebody's head and into the marketplace. And by the market, I mean helps everyone else. I think we have innovators. I think they think of ideas. Some of those ideas are good ideas. And some of those good ideas get turned into a prototype. And once you have that prototype, you can show it to a customer or an investor or retailer and ask, is this really a good idea? Will you use it? And if the world thinks it's a good idea, we know there is a global network of manufacturers and distributors and retailers who can take that idea and spread it around the world. Someday soon, we might just call this Amazon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so in this funny model, I think there are two bottlenecks. One is a source of good ideas. Two is being able to take that idea and actually physically realize it. So how do we make more good ideas? I think we need to make more innovators. So if we make more innovators, we have more ideas. 
more good ideas, and if we can make it stupid easy to take an idea and actually realize it, then we've widened up that last bottleneck, and I hope the previous slides have showed you that now, over the last 10 years, it is very different. Um, you can really realize an idea very quickly and easily. And if we do this, now we've created a pipeline uh, from people's minds to the market uh, and made it incredibly easy to spread these good ideas around. So the last question I'll ask now is, uh, what, what is equity? What's real equity? Is it wealth distribution or is it knowledge distribution? Is it more sustainable if somebody gives me a fish or if I know that I can teach myself how to fish or teach myself anything or build anything or do anything? Uh, by 2050, we'll have about 10 billion people on this planet. I hope that'll be 10 billion educated and empowered innovators. I think that's an excellent way to find value to combat what AI and robotics and automation will be taking from conventional jobs. And I can't think of a problem that you can't throw at 10 billion hardworking, smart people and solve it. That's the kind of place I want to live. Uh, let's see if we can make it happen. Thanks so much.